Korea is on assignment overseas as we track the ongoing protests across China against the Communist Party's highly restrictive zero COVID policy. Now, this is an unprecedented show of defiance from Beijing to Shanghai to Xinjiang. The tipping point was last week's deadly apartment fire where residents say excessive lockdowns delayed firefighters from reaching the victims. Now, thousands are declaring that they've had enough, even some calling for the removal of Chinese leader Xi Jinping. Here at home, the protests could even impact your holiday shopping, with workers at Apple's largest iPhone factory among those joining the protests. The White House today voicing support for peaceful protests and reiterating its long-held belief that China won't be able to contain the virus through their zero COVID strategy. We start now with NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer in Beijing. And Janice, you've been living this. Describe how zero COVID impacts every aspect of daily life there and why these protests are so remarkable. Well, I think what makes these protests remarkable, Garrett, is that they are simultaneous protests happening in multiple cities with people rallying around a single issue in a country where open defiance is a risk. It comes with dangers. What, what we're talking about with zero COVID is a, a system that has control over every aspect of daily life, of uh, how you travel, where you can travel travel, uh, near daily testing, uh, quarantines, lockdowns, restrictions on your mobility. It's been three years of this and people have been growing frustrated. There was the sense that maybe things would change after the 20th Party Congress, once Xi Jinping was able to sh uh, sew up his leadership within the party. But then things didn't change. And that's why by the time the boiling point hit on Friday night with that tragic fire, anger had really been brewing. And it's why we're seeing this, this swell of defiance, people chanting openly, calling for freedom, calling to end lockdowns, to end the testing, to end all of these things that have upended daily life, have choked the economy, and have left people three years into the pandemic gasping. What is also lacking here is any clear exit strategy from the leadership to suggest to people that there is a way out. Let's talk about the COVID response part of it, since that's what this all stems from. I mean, China isn't using the mRNA vaccines that much of the Western world is using. Their elderly population isn't fully inoculated. Why is China kind of sticking with almost an 18th century response to the pandemic when they've got 21st century tools available to them? This is the golden question. There, there was a time when uh, zero COVID made sense as a public health strategy to try to contain uh, cases, to try to quarantine people, to, to prevent the virus from spreading. Uh, the sense is among critics is that the government has since squandered the time, that for the past three years, so much has gone into building this massive infrastructure uh, to lock cities down, to take people away to quarantine. They're building these mass quarantine centers of uh, shipping containers that are spread out in acres of fields. Uh, so there is the sense that all of the effort went into scaling up that aspect of controlling the virus and the vaccinations part of it wasn't scaled up in the same way. There is a woefully low vaccination rate among the elderly and the vulnerable here. And as well, those foreign mRNA vaccines still haven't been approved here. Uh, so there is the sense that the government of Xi Jinping is now in a very tough position because they're having to quell the unrest uh, that has been growing over several days and shows a few signs of letting up and also at the same time trying to not back away from this signature policy that they have held up as a success to this point. All right, James Mackey Freyer, thank you for your great reporting from China. We appreciate it. We've got much more to discuss on this topic. And here with us now is Richard Stengel, former Undersecretary of State in the Obama administration, and PBS NewsHour chief correspondent Amna Nawaz, who in January will be the next co-anchor of PBS NewsHour alongside 
friend of the show, Jeff Bennett. Um, so, Rick, I'll start with you. Uh, Tiananmen Square was now 33 years ago. We, now we've once again seen here protesters from all walks of life, despite the challenges that Janice laid out, uniting in their opposition to zero COVID. Could this be another potential tipping point for China? Yes, Garrett, it could. And one of the differences between Tiananmen Square in 1989 and today is social media and the fact that we're watching when people are filming on their phones, we're watching people hold up white paper like this because of the suppression of free speech. Um, it's really an extraordinary thing. And it shows, I would argue, the universal hunger for freedom and democracy that the Chinese people have wanted for a long time. But more importantly, you know, in this kind of global twilight existential struggle between democracy and authoritarianism, what the zero COVID policy shows is that an authoritarian response to a pandemic is less successful than the democratic response. The democratic response in Western nations using vaccines, uh, allowing people to, to, to mingle, you know, allowing things like FIFA and the World Cup. I think to eyes around the world, people are looking, well, maybe that Western system, that American system, that democratic system is better than that authoritarian system that has zero uh, tolerance and lockdowns that doesn't work. Well, it's interesting. I mean, pick your issue set, but we've seen uprisings against authoritative, authoritarian systems in China and Iran and Russia, all of our different issue sets all over the last seven months with different elements of that in play. And Amna, you know, as Rick pointed out, we've seen these protesters holding their blank white pieces of paper, trying to protest censorship in a creative way. You've got the Internet scrubbing any hint of unrest off the Chinese Internet. And now even coverage of the World Cup in China is being altered not to show the maskless crowds. Talk a little bit about this cat and mouse game that's going on between government censors and Chinese people who are trying to get their message across to the rest of the world and to their fellow Chinese. Hey, Garrett, I think it's important to point out that level of censorship is not necessarily anything new, which to Rick's point is, is further underscores just how remarkable and unprecedented these scenes are, that that many people have been taking to the streets and cities across the country, and it's uniting people across a number of different sections of the population there. It's not just young Chinese people and university students, it's middle class, it's the elite, it's factory workers, it's people coming out not just to protest these strict COVID lockdowns, but also to call for free speech and their right to uh, to be able to protest, to call for a free media to, and press to be able to report on this, and to call, in many cases, for the removal of President Xi. I mean, these are remarkable scenes we are seeing. Mm -hmm. That said, that censorship that you're noting right there, that is part and parcel of the authoritarian regime's response. This is a, a government that heavily monitors its population, heavily censors its population, and is quick to crack down on any dissent, as we have already seen. The difference, I think, right now, in a very unique set of circumstances that we're seeing in China, separate and apart from other protests in other places, is that you're talking about three years of frustration and anger that have built and built and built in a policy that the government would hold up as a success. Yes, they managed to keep their death rate uh, to one of the lowest per capita in the world, I think just in the thousands. Um, and at the same time, they reached a breaking point. That breaking point has now been crossed. The government's new question is now, which outbreak does it deal with? If they loosen restrictions right. and they deal with what will certainly be a rise in COVID cases, that is one outbreak, or do they somehow manage to deal with this outbreak of rage and frustration that is not going anywhere? <laughs> right, their death rate is so low now, but so is their vaccination rate. So you roll back one set of challenges, you face another. Um, Rick, the Chinese Communist Party had always relied on China's economic growth as part of how it quelled dissent. You know, people who were making a ton of money were less likely to come out into the streets complaining about some of these issues. But now you're seeing GDP growth falling off there from 8% to something like 3% over the next year. Um, how does that change in China's economic condition affect the, the force behind these protests going forward? I'm sure it does, Garrett. I mean, I saw the same figure as you did. The GDP growth for the last three or four months was something like 3.2%, and they were forecasting 5.5%, mm -hmm. uh, so it's down by 50%. Remember, you, when there are lockdowns, you don't have any foot traffic. You don't have uh, uh, people going to factories. The, the, uh, the Foxconn factory that makes Apple products in Chengdu, a city of 21 million people, has shut down. That's going to cause uh, price increases all around the world. Um, 
But I want to make one other point, and Amna made a, a fantastic points about the protest. But you mentioned Tiananmen Square. I went back and was reading about it this morning. The Tiananmen Square protest existed for six weeks, kind of unfettered, mm. uh, before the Chinese government did anything. So their model is actually not quick suppression of protest, but waiting and planning a kind of a more complete crackdown. I hope that doesn't happen now. I think it would be smart for Xi Jinping to show a bit of openness. That would help uh, quell some of the protests, but that remains to be seen whether that will be the case. Well, and it's incumbent upon all of us to keep our eyes focused on this over the days and weeks to come and not sort of turn away as the crackdown starts. Uh, Rick Stengel, Amna Nawaz, thank you both. We could do the whole hour on this, but I got to let you go. So thank you both for coming on. And coming up, guess who's coming to dinner? Republicans, slow to react after Donald Trump, host an anti-Semite and a white supremacist at his Mar-a-Lago club over the Thanksgiving weekend. This is Andrea Mitchell reports only on MSNBC. I want to back up real quick pertaining to this situation going on in China. The reason why that this has now become mainstream media COVID response part of it since that's is because there's now so much outcry pertaining to on, on the social media that basically it can no longer be hidden or swept under the rug. You basically have the same type of scenario happening in Iran where the people are protesting about their humanitarian rights and you have other skirmishes, if you know anything about international affairs, basically all over the world right now, in people standing up against their regime, and they're tired of being told and ordered and basically put into a category of be, basically being a slave. And I, I kind of halfway seen this coming, not quite as much as what I am now, pertaining to the unrest in all these major communist-controlled countries. Even Russia, which is a communist-controlled country, even though they have yet to overthrow that regime, there's enough resistance in that country that they are putting a, a strain on the regime itself pertaining to the, the uh, the system itself, the resources that Usually one thing adds to another. It's, it's, it's kind of like insult to injury to the point that eventually something will snap. Something will break. That usually leads into basically a internal civil war. These are all part of Bible prophecies that Jesus tried to warn people about that was going to occur in the last days that there will be commotions, there will be wars, there will be rumors of wars, there will be outbreaks, there will be disturbances that will be unlike the world has ever seen. I am really, really surprised that 30 years plus since Ronald Reagan finally accomplished what that administration set out to accomplish that it has taken this long for something major to actually set in. We know that our great nation, America, has always stood in and behind and with we the people. 
in giving the people a certain amount of dignity and giving the people a certain amount of rights to be able to operate, perform, and go about their daily lives in a, um, in a prosperous, safe way. Because the initial statement had not come forth openly with the church communities here in America. Now I'm going to blame more of it on the church communities or the so-called church communities than I am the politicians. Because this resistance movement even though it was implemented by politicians, it was supported in the sense of a resistance of the founder of the Windmill Ministries coming from the so-called church communities. But because they were so full of hypocrisy and they talked about the one world government, they talked about the new world order, they talked about the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and the false prophet and the two witnesses and the, and the teachings coming out of the last chapter of Daniel. They talked about these things, but they wasn't willing to implicate them. They wasn't willing to actually stand with the founder of the Windmill Ministries that put forth so much time and effort, so much energy, so much money in the 30 years that he spent towards trying to get this message out to the general public. Once more, I was basically shot out of the saddle before I ever even got out of the gate good because of various individuals that did not want to see the manifestation of prophecies coming true. They talked about the prophecies coming true. They talked about different things, but then the American people, by and large, would turn right around and allow for various politicians to lead them down this endless road, like going to war with Saddam Hussein, convincing everybody that Saddam Hussein had ma bombs of mass destruction, and come to find out it was nothing more than a pure mere lie coming from the politicians. So one hand helped to embrace the other hand in this resistance movement that was totally against the founder of the Windmill Ministries missions. Now you have to start asking the question, why was they against the Windmill Ministries missions? What did the founder ever do to these people that caused them to abruptly go up against uh, the teachings that he was had been promoting ever since that he had an encounter with a supernatural uh, being or with supernatural beings pertaining to the angels of God coming out of heaven, how come they were so prone of wanting to go up against this? Once more, it was motivated from within that they talked the talk, but they wasn't willing to walk the walk. Now, since social media has come into play, now my voice or my message can now get out to the general public in much, much more of a public statement type way to where now I'm not just going to individual churches from church building to church building to church door to church door. Now I'm not just going uh, from vehicle to vehicle towards putting information underneath people's uh, windshield washers are handing people literature pertaining to the windmill ministries. Now, I can tell people how that the very people that I told this message to went up against the messenger because they didn't like the message. Even though the message has always been about love, grace, it's always been about peace, utopia, prosperity, it's been about safety, it's been about anything that surrounds utopia and God-fearing, peaceful people. That's what the message has always been about. But they have tried and tried and tried to bury me either emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and yes, to some degree, even physically. 
And now, 30 some odd years has passed since I've stood out into the eyes of the general public that still to this day have basically gotten a negative response from not only the community in general, but from the so-called church community in this area, as well as the national community, as far as this message going further out than just five or six, seven counties wide. What we're seeing in the exchange of all these protests, regardless whether it be in China, regardless whether it be in Iran, regardless whether it be in Russia pertaining to the war in Ukraine, what we're seeing is the prophecies coming true for it says that it was as the noise of thunder, one of the beasts said, come and see, looking over the threshold of the, of the very kingdom of God, where the twenty and four elders and where the four beasts was, where God himself holds his domain, domain pertaining to his throne, his majesty, uh, what we're seeing is prophecy coming true right in front of our very eyes, for it was as the noise of thunder. Because like I said, it's not just China. It's not just Iran. It's not just Russia. There are little bitty countries all over the world right now that are literally imploding. They are imploding because their oligarchs, their uh, uh, authoritarian system has basically failed the people and because it's to each his own now towards saving their own hides you're seeing these authoritarian uh, governments crack down on their people and as they're cracking down on their people the people are cracking down on these regimes which is causing that much more of of uh basically violence and I don't think that we've even begin to, to uh, see the beginning phases yet of what's going on in China because of so many people over the, in China and because of China being so strong and because China does have a million man plus army and don't think for a second that they won't turn on their own people because they will it'll literally turn into a bloodbath I'm pretty sure somebody will pull the plug in thinking that, that the rest of the world ain't going to see what's going on. But with social media being so strong now towards everybody and their brother having a telephone, you don't necessarily have to have contact with the Internet to still be able to get your message out. All you have to do is record it on your device and then give it to somebody that can give it to somebody that can put it on social media platform. So there's no escape. There's no escape pertaining to these illegitimate regimes that have been bamboozling their people for now hundreds, if not thousands of years towards now, the true light has focused upon to these, to these countries and, and these evil demonic uh, oligarchs that now are going to be captured, are caught right in the very act pertaining to social media platform. You know, I prayed and prayed and prayed. I don't know how many times. Because I knew of my educational um, privileges being very, very weak. That God, even in, even in uh, Roland Anchor's trailer court, whenever I lived there from 1995 up until about 2001, <coughs> maybe it was 2002, somewhere around in that area, whenever we moved from Madison County, over to Henderson County. <coughs> but I prayed and prayed and prayed during that time that we did temporarily have a computer system set up in our home. <coughs> but I also knew how wicked and demonic and, and tempting <coughs> that the Internet service had become pertaining to all the poison that was on there. I prayed and prayed and prayed for God, please bring forth some sort of new invention 
to where it will be more appropriate, to where it will be more convenient, pertaining to the dragon, being able to translate your speech and actually put it, document it, just like a dictator in a courtroom, dictate it and put it on digital platform. That way people can at least read. If they can't get a hold of my video, maybe they can at least read some of the material that I'm trying to put out to the world. Please, God, please, God, please, God, bring that into an existence. And I didn't know what I was praying for at the time was basically praying for smartphone technology. I had no idea during the time that I was so, so sincere in wanting God to make a move because I knew that because of this resistance movement that is still just as prone today as it ever has been here in America towards people not wanting to support the founder of the Windmill Ministries, I knew that if I was ever going to be able to reach contact out to the outer layers of the community, that I was going to have to have some sort of major, major tool, some sort of, of a uh, transportation to be able to do so. Today, since 2015, I was fortunate enough to go ahead and grab a hold of that smartphone technology and use it, not for my good, not for the good of the ministry, but for the good and the glory of God Almighty and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, all these other people that get a hold of this message, it's locally around here, they can remain bittered up. They can remain sold up. They can remain hardened pertaining to the decisions that they have made in the past 30 plus years because seemingly it don't matter where I go around in this particular area, I get identified. Matter of fact, that was one reason why that I didn't want to wind up going to Black Friday in Walmart, in Martin, or in Walmart in Union City is because I know so many people here in the two counties areas that there's always that possibility that I would get caught up into some sort of confrontation. As a matter of fact, I was at the drugstore the other day, and I never turned my head around, but I recognized the voice, but I couldn't put a face to it or a name to it. But somebody said uh, in a hateful type way, and they may have been joking, I don't know, Jimmy, you need to hurry up, man. You're holding up the line. Well, I was doing just exactly what everybody else was doing. You know, you got to give people time to do their thing, and then... You move forward and you wait till that person does their thing and you move forward and then it comes time for you to do your thing. I mean, I can't move people any quicker than what the uh, the tellers wanted to move pertaining to the people in the pharmacy. But yet, no, my name got splattered out there like I was doing something wrong. Like I said, it, it may have been in a jokative type way. But sometimes unintended consequences happen. And sometimes that's all it takes to start a confrontation. So rather than me concentrate on being in a confrontation, I actually went out of my way on Black Friday. I went to Milan Walmart. I went to Huntington Walmart. I went to Paris, Tennessee Walmart and wound up in, in um, Clarksville, Tennessee Walmart. And out of all the Walmarts, the best one was Clarksville, Tennessee. And I don't think I'll never go to another Walmart come Black Friday or any type of deals around here locally that I, for now on out, will make a trip all the way to Clarksville or to a bigger Walmart because they have so much more to offer. It was unbelievable at the merchandise, their inventory of how that it just uh, it, it was just unbelievable and how much more that they had to offer and how, how many more deals that they had in a bigger Walmart versus a smaller Walmart because a smaller Walmart, they're, they're limited in how, how, how much merchandise that they can put in there. And they got to go through some sort of an assessment to where, you know, we can't, we can't put everything that we got in this one building because the building ain't big enough to hold it all. So from now on out, if I ever do a, another Black Friday hunting uh, um, shopping spree, I'm going to go to the bigger Walmart. 
for two reasons. A, they got more. B, I don't have to worry about the locals around here towards running into somebody that's wind up going to start a confrontation. For some reason, the seed of bitterness, the seed of hate, the seed of uh, resistances have been planted into this area that basically makes this area the core area of where all this began that one day these people are going to give an account for because they didn't support the windmill ministries. They didn't support the things that the, wind, that the, that the uh, messenger was putting forth even though they didn't like the message. One day, these people are going to give an account. Not only, not only are they revelation deniers pertaining to end time biblical Bible prophecy, but they're also, majority of them around here are climate deniers still, and the majority of them around here are election deniers. And you'll still run into people to this day Believe it or not, I know this is going to sound kind of weird, but you'll still run into people today, periodically, everywhere around here that I can think of, that you'll run into some little old woman and you'll say something to her, well, how do you feel? Well, I feel all right. Uh, uh, I took the flu shot, but I didn't take that other shot. I don't think that that, that uh, COVID is, was ever real to begin with. Even though we're seeing literal countries that are exploding or imploding because basically of COVID that has upset the apple cart, you still have people in Northwest Tennessee and probably all over the country, as far as that goes, that are still in denial about the coronavirus pandemic. And the only explanation that I can give for these people that don't want to evolve that don't want to accept reality towards it being reality is that these people are under some sort of hypnotic spell. They have been lied to for so long that now their pride is in the way. And rather than them come clean in their confession that they was wrong, they rather hold that in their minds and in their hearts towards telling everybody Oh, no, we never did believe that. Oh, no, we're not going to take the shot. Oh, the shot had uh, this in it. The shot had that in it. Uh, we're not We're not going to be controlled by our government pretending to these shots. COVID never was real. But yet, no, we see, we see stuff like this every day on national TV. Basically, portable hospitals. Uh what what basically flabbergasted me whenever COVID first come into existence is that basically we didn't have intel at the time towards feet being on the ground pretending to the CIA in regards towards the, the pandemic that had set in. But what we could see through our satellites is that these people was building these massive, massive portable buildings in just a few days that was basically uh, building them for containment centers because of the spread of COVID that was unleashed into that area. We did see that. Donald Trump seen that. But even though we've seen that, that we're still not a red flag raised pertaining to the transport transportation system with the with the airlines towards basically banning anybody from coming over into that area back over here to America to protect us from this pandemic. It wasn't until later on whenever basically America got slapped in the face with this pandemic that they decided to put restrictions on airplane flights. We have seen cargo boats um, we have seen other things that are just out of the ordinary, and this is only another one of those things that's out of the ordinary that is happening right now. And I promise you, if we over here in America was going through what them people are going through right now, our whole concept, 
our whole perspective would be different than what it is right now towards still running into people today that still swears and be damns that COVID, the pandemic, never, ever existed. If you was having to go through what these people are going through and you seen all the death and destruction that fell up into those people's lives because of the pandemic, I promise you, you would have a different perspective about COVID. I think that their problems in China have only began. And I personally believe that whoever, whatever, that formulated this over in China had no earthly ideal in the severity of what that they was doing whenever they unleashed this virus up into the origin, the core of the originality of that area. I still think that North Korea had something to do with it. I can't prove it, but no one can disprove it. But I still think that North Korea was trying to set up the 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 um, government in China by making it look like that they was in the process of crowd control because right before COVID hit, they was going through similar type situations towards people rising up against that type of tyranny, against that type of control. And all of a sudden, here come COVID. Well, now, I can foresee that it's backfiring on whoever wanted to do whatever that they wanted to do in controlling the masses out of fear, out of intimidation, out of whatever, disease, chemical, biological control. Um, I can now see this backfiring on that regime over in China. And if things are not immediately changed, with their government. I am going to go as far as to say that we are only seeing the beginning developments of all this that are only going to grow worse. I don't know how worse. I don't know how long that it's going to get worse. But I'm telling you right now, people are fed up with being pushed around and shoved around. Their lives has been totally, not completely out of order over there. And if we think that we have been inconvenienced over here, you can only imagine what type of situation that those people are going through, just like the, the women over in Iran and just like the, the uh, civilian population over in Russia to where uh, poisonous Putin decided to put out a draft making people go to war, even though he had told them originally that this was going to be something that was going to be done very, very quick and very, very uh, prestigiously, and that we wouldn't have to worry about involving the open population pertaining to their civilians over in Russia, that now is proven that that was nothing more than a lie. One lie upon top of another lie usually requires more lies to cover up the first lies. And people are catching on to this type of illegitimacy. And to be quite honest with you, I support the people in China that's standing up against that regime. I support the people that's in Iran that's standing up against that regime. And I stand with the people over in Russia that's standing up against that regime. Because people should not be herded like a bunch of cows. They shouldn't be ruled like a bunch of slaves like a bunch of animals. That was the whole primary purpose that God um, chose Moses to be the great liberator to let his people go. Humanitarian rights. And the humanitarian rights isn't just for the Christians. Humanitarian rights is for any and everybody that has a, a good sound mind that can govern their own decisions and what they do in what they do towards the betterment of society, being safe and uh, 
prosperous, but it wasn't just for the God-fearing Christians. It was for the fairness of humanitarian people, for the people. And it took a major, major calamity to happen with the children of Israel pertaining to the Pharaohs in order to break that barrier or that stumbling block that had been put upon to the people. And today, I feel like that it's probably going to take something substantial, maybe not maybe not on that same level, but maybe even on a greater level, to be able to break this stumbling block, these barriers that are now haunting, haunting, plaguing these evil, demonic regimes. And that's exactly what they are. Just like Ronald Reagan said, pertaining to Russia, that their empire was evil to tear down that wall. Well, they tore down the physical wall. They tore the physical wall down and gave the appearances like that they was going to do a 180, but they never tore down their monetary wall. They never tore down their social wall. They never tore down their resistance against humanitarian rights in the sense towards allowing their people to have their own lives, to be able to govern their lives in the way that they seem fit towards the guarantee of happiness and are the guarantee of the pursuit of happiness and something else that our Constitution reads. It may be the it may be the uh, the other letter I don't know but but somewhere in there it says that our government guarantees that we have the right to pursue legitimacy, prosperity, and happiness. And you're not going to have those three things in these communist-controlled countries. And it doesn't matter if it's a big country like China. Or, or Russia, or if it's a smaller country like Iran, like some of these other third world countries, it doesn't matter if, if you're trying to imprison people by fear and intimidation, if you're trying to control people's lives because of the oligarchs that want to rule and, and make all the profits off of sweat, tears, and blood, it's, it's, a, wrong, it's a wrong system. It's a, it's, a, it's a dirty, perverted, evil, demonic system that our ancestors stood up for during the Revolutionary War and said, enough is enough. We're not going to be mandated or controlled by King George III and him telling us every single cotton-picking move to make and then all the profits going to him. So I, I, I strongly believe that, that we're only seeing the beginning phases of what's happening over in China. I, I truly do. I, I, I wish that I wasn't right. I wish that I was wrong. But from all indications of what's happening over there towards the, towards the way that it's building up. And, of course, I remember uh, when it, whenever COVID first hit over in that area, that right before it hit, there was massive protesting because of our freedoms over here and the, politi the political race that was so predominant in the way that we handle our affairs over here, that people was catching on. They was smartening up. They was coming out of the woodwork. And that's what's happening right now. And unless the China regime is willing to compromise, unless... The Iranian regime is willing to compromise unless the Russian regime and people, other regimes like that, are willing to compromise with their own citizens. You're only going to see things get drastically worse. And I still put the blame 
off on what did not happen that should have happened with the founder of the Windmill Ministries whenever he first started getting out into the eyes of the general public in 1989 after nine tapes went to the White House in 1988 I still say that this country let me let me rephrase that I still say that certain people within our government and certain people within our so-called church communities will stand guilty for not doing the proper and the right thing that they obviously thought that they was going to be able to destroy an individual's life, not just monetarily, not just mentally, not just emotionally, but physically, they felt like that they was going to conquer, basically the conqueror, the very person that had the message to begin with towards allowing for the Holy Spirit to work in the way that the Holy Spirit worked in the latter part of Ronald Reagan's administration towards getting the Berlin Wall to fall. I've never seen nothing like this. I've never read about nothing like this. I've never heard about anything like this other than putting it in the same category of the spiritual warfare, the resistance movement that occurred during the time of other prophets, including the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you get to looking, I've said this before, if you get to looking at, at uh, the king that was the king during the time of Jesus Christ coming into the world, I think it was King Herod. There had already been so much talk about Bible prophecy of this certain particular prophecy that was going to come forth pertaining to this king that was going to be willing to sacrifice his life for all a man's sins and that he was going to die, but on the third day that he would rise again. It was even predicted in how that he was going to die. It was even predicted in him not basically um, nobody breaking his legs. It, it, everything that was done was already pre-selected and predicted a thousand plus years way before Jesus ever come into existence because of that evil regime that was in control at that time heard about this existences of this birth and because it frightened this regime so badly this regime was willing to take out over 5,000 of its own infants to try to destroy the one infant, even though that infant had not yet done anything either good or bad or for or against that particular regime, that regime was freaked out. That regime didn't want that prophecy to, to exist, didn't want it to fulfill itself. So it done everything in the world to stop the Lord Jesus Christ, but God made a way for Mary and Joseph to take the child from that area that escaped that type of wrath. If you know anything about biblical history, you can look at the calling that Moses had in his life. You can look at the calling that other prophets of God had in their lives towards how that the devil done everything in the world toward trying to stop it from ever occurring. And that's basically the only thing that I can lead to an example that will come close to that in which what has occurred with the founder of the Windmill Ministries right here in Weekly County, Tennessee at 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee, zip code 38255. Now those that are not spiritually discerned and spiritually minded, they're going to listen to this and they're probably going to snigger and laugh over it. They're going to be entertained by it because they're going to say, what a fool. What an idiot. What an idiot that would say such of a thing. Well, see, that's the difference between their thinking and our thinking. We know that this warfare that we're up against pertaining to this spiritual warfare is real. We know that obviously something is motivating people that you meet on aisle three that suddenly want to get bitter and hateful and, and 
and uh, act the way that they act, even though you haven't spoken to them or done nothing to them, just the pure mere fact of the spirit that's guiding them versus the spirit that's guiding us is two different spirits. And because of it, there is a conflict of a supernatural spirit world. Spiritual warfare. And, you know, I have to look at my enemy towards my enemy being my enemy pertaining to the adversaries that the Christian society has. And it's not just my enemy, but it's all of the Christian society's enemy pertaining to the Luciferian spirit that has now inundated so many people's lives. But at the same time, just because they are my adversary or they are not, they are my enemy does not mean that I am supposed to hate their internal souls towards wishing them to go to hell number one, and number two, there's always that possibility that maybe, maybe my enemy will repent, and instead of my enemy being my enemy, maybe my enemy will become a supporter, or being on the same side as far as being an ally. So far, I, I haven't seen no, no Truths in regards to a 30-year message of a man being rejected and treated the way that he's been treated. So far, I haven't seen no allies. Oh, I'm pretty sure they talk the talk, those that get a hold of the message. Well, well, he's just way off a beat. Well, he's just this way. He's just that way. Am I really? Am I really? Proof is in the pudding, my friend, toward what has occurred in the lifespan of the Windmill Ministries missions. And that goes just as deeply towards the Neils as it does any other family that has been raised up into this area that could have helped with the messenger towards getting out the message, but obviously they didn't want the message. They talk about peace, but in reality, do they really want peace? You know, I've heard this many, many times that the courts can't make money off of peace. The lawyers can't make money off of peace. The sheriffs and, and the probation officers, they can't make money. The courts can't make money off of peace. Well, because of that attitude has put us where we are today. And because of that attitude, has basically helped to put this world off into the position that this world is in right now towards all these uprisings that's going on that's now causing that's now causing supply chain issues it's now causing uh, people to raise uh, petroleum oil products it's causing food to, to rise and causing other events to happen towards one event uh, influencing another event. I mean, I just got off the phone a while ago with an individual from DirecTV. Uh, he was in Montgomery, Alabama towards me in one of the biggest uh, towns, uh, growing towns in, in America towards it growing in leaps and bounds. Um, but I just got to explaining to him, you know, I remember very, very well because I was out there on the road at the time traveling on my own dime, going from catastrophe to catastrophe. Whenever the real estate market deal popped along about 2008, 2009. And I was buying gas at that time for right around $5 a gallon right here. But. I didn't see all these other prices escalate the way that they have escalated this time. This has been something that has been totally unprecedented. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people that still has a lot of money that can afford uh, the Black Friday spending uh, fiasco that had occurred. And they claim now that the digital sales that's going to be promoted on online is even going to exceed that like 11 billion so obviously a lot of people still got money here in america that's spending it but there's a lot of people that don't have money 
that's already spent what money that they got, people that's on welfare, social services programs, people that's already done sifted through the cracks, and those are the people that are being brutally damaged and hurt right now. Those are the people that's taking it on the cheek right now that overexpended their their uh, um, their way of life and trying to keep up with the Joneses. And now this has basically hit them sideways in being over budgeted. And now it's basically causing havoc in, in hundreds of millions of millions of people's lives. And I was, you know, told today on one of these shows, commentator shows, that you buy now and you spend later. You buy now and you spend later. You buy you you, you buy it now and you pay for it later. That's their memento. You buy it now, but you pay for it later. I just wonder how many people out there right now that are buying what they're buying on credit and they have no intentions towards ever paying it back. So you can't tell me that us, we as a society here in America, is not spiraling down into a major, major calamity, regardless whether you want to call it a recession, a depression, or whatever you want to call it, um, we, we will see the aftermath of what's going on right now, probably long about February or March. In addition to the supply chain issues, in addition to the higher gas prices, in addition to people living paycheck to paycheck that's already on the edge of losing everything uh, that's basically causing people to wig out, that's causing people to, to uh, get violent, or it's causing people to commit suicide, or it's causing people to do things that they ordinarily never would do. We are now starting to see the major results in what's fixing to happen. So, you know, the big retail stores, they can brag all they want to about this being a great grand year. But I guarantee you, out of that $9 billion right there that happened on Friday, I'm going to say over half of it was bought in imaginary plastic funds. And probably out of that half has no intentions of paying back what that they have put on the books. Who do you think is going to pay for that? Our government. Our resources are being strained every day in some form or fashion, either by ignorance, greed, selfishness, dishonesty, or now with the forces of nature doing what they're doing. And we're on a spiral of going down, being 30 plus trillion dollars in debt. And if you can't see that or understand that, obviously you're in a different form of reality than what people such as myself that can see what's happening, including what's going on in China, Iran, Russia, and all these other places. Good luck to all of us. God bless America. As we want to say, may heaven help us all. God bless our American troops. God bless our endeavors towards where we go from here. And good luck to all of us. And shalom.